John Howard Semple, Chief Constable, Brody Ferry Borough Police Force. This is the story of a murder. The hall where the body was found was in a very disordered state and bore evidence of a desperate struggle having taken place. A particularly brutal and bloody murder which happened in Broughty Ferry near Dundee in 1912. The victim was a woman called Jean Milne and her murder remains a mystery to this day. My name is Niamh McDade. I'm a professor of forensic science at the University of Dundee and I'm also the director of the Levy Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science at Dundee University. I think this case is is particularly important for a number of reasons. Uh, One is that it's local to Dundee and to its environs. The murder happened in Broughty Ferry, which is not too far away from Dundee. Also, it's because the case is unsolved. As a result of that, it's useful, I think, sometimes to take a look from maybe a more modern day perspective on um, unsolved cases, including ones that stretch back as long as as Jean Milne's case, to see is there anything that we know now that might be able to help, but equally, is there anything that was done back then that may have opened up avenues of, of investigation that perhaps were not pursued at that time because maybe the science wasn't evolved or the manner and approach of the investigators weren't the same as perhaps they would be now. In this second episode of the Inside Forensic Science podcast, we're going to try and find out more about Jean Milne and her life in and around Dundee to give some context to the crime and provide some avenues for the investigation. If you've just started listening to the series, go back and listen to episode one, which gives a detailed description of the crime scene and the events leading up to the discovery of the body. The body was discovered at Jean Milne's house in Broughty Ferry. So Broughty Ferry was uh, essentially started as a separate little uh, village uh, based around fishing community uh, just to the east of Dundee. Matthew Jarron is museum curator at the University of Dundee. And at that time, it was still a separate borough, uh, but there was already discussions underway to extend the boundaries of, of Dundee. And so, in fact, it was the following year, 1913, that it became annexed and became part of Dundee. But already it was home to a number of the wealthier citizens of Dundee who wanted to build nice big houses away from all the fumes of the factory chimneys. And that was one of the key areas that they chose to do that. So there was a huge expansion of quite grand mansions and indeed some huge great castles and other extraordinary sort of baronial seats uh, that were really quite impressive. Many of them, unfortunately, have now gone because it just just wasn't the money to keep them up. But uh, it's still is the case that it's one of the wealthier parts of of Dundee. And in fact, there was a time when it was said that that a certain part of Broughty Ferry contained more millionaires per square foot than anywhere else in the world. I don't know if that's actually true, but that was a a common sort of urban myth about the place. So it was definitely a sort of desirable residence, as indeed it, it still is today. So where do we begin? So I think the starting point on any murder investigation of this nature is that Um, Stranger attacks are so, so rare. Commander Dave McLaren heads up homicide investigations for the Metropolitan Police Service. You really need to start by looking at the people who are within that close, you know, either circle of friends, that close community, uh, the people that that would know that she lives alone, that she would be quite vulnerable, would know that she has, you know, quite, quite a wealth. Um, So... So while she wouldn't rule out this, you know, someone from out with the town coming into the to the area and committing such a crime, um, you know, your list of hypotheses, if you like, would definitely include people that knew her, people that were, um, you know, I think one of the, the very early doors to rule out um, a robbery or some sort of criminal, you know, criminality in terms of um, her wealth. Uh, as a as a motive, whereas that would be high on our sort of agenda, if you like, in terms of a modern day investigation. So, where an individual sits in a community, the the, the circles that they move within um, would be a massive line of investigation. Um, and and I can think back to you know numerous investigations over the years where, as I say, it's so so rare to get a stranger attack. Never ever you know never ever um, completely exclude it, but 
you know, if you were if you were looking to progress an investigation quickly, most times it's someone that they knew. So you need to find out about who someone was, the circles they moved in, and who they knew. Something crime scene manager Helen Ireland of Police Scotland calls victimology. Somebody will be responsible. I'll have the role of doing the victimology, and that's gathering evidence um, on the victim, uh, speaking to family, friends. Um, that's normally carried out by a family liaison officer. That's what we would have deployed today. Um, they are um, obviously detectives that go and speak with the family and gain as much information uh, from the victim's life as possible and then feed that back into the inquiry team. And then there might be somebody, depending on, on the individual um, and what they do, um, someone will then draw up a timeline of, of perhaps their life and um, sort of their interests, their associates, have they ever been involved in any sort of um, alcohol, drugs, any criminality, uh, what type of person they were, just to try and um, find out who, you know, who may have been responsible and, and establish a motive as well. They might not have called it victimology, but in 1912, the police did just that. They started out by trying to get a sense of who Jean Milne was. Detective Lieutenant John Trench was brought in from Glasgow to help, and he started his investigation into Jean Milne's life at her house in Broughty Ferry. The house is a large mansion house, surrounded by about two acres of ground. The main entrance is from Grove Road, and there's a short avenue leading up to the house. The house itself is surrounded by trees and shrubs, and there's an extensive orchard at the back of the house with conservatory, fern house and vinery. In ordinary circumstances, the house would require a staff of at least three servants, and the ground would require to be attended by a gardener with an assistant. I observed that there is 15 chimney cans on the house, and should think there is 23 apartments therein. The grounds of the house were practically a wilderness. The orchard and the outhouses were all practically in a state of ruin, all showing signs of years of neglect. The deceased lady appears to have been an eccentric person. Her correspondence all goes to show that she was a person, although of the age of 69, who liked people to think that gentlemen were always admiring her. She seems to have been of a religious turn of mind, and her correspondence for the last 50 years, which was found in the house, shows that she has led a clean life. Her correspondence with other people, who have all been interviewed and whose statements are all in the possession of Chief Constable Semple, show that she was a lady who took a deep interest in matters relating to church affairs. She seems to have contributed freely to various church funds. The house, with the exception of the dining room and the deceased lady's bedroom, showed signs of neglect. Many of the rooms had evidently not been entered for years. The dining room is a large apartment, and there is a large table which was littered with books and papers of every description therein. I saw numerous valuable articles lying open on the dining room table and although the room was in a very untidy condition, it did not appear to have been ransacked. Jean Milne's perceived eccentricity is something which comes up time and again in the evidence files in the case against the key suspect, a man called Charles Warner. In the summary at the start of the files, it says, Miss Jean Milne, a maiden lady 69 years of age, resided alone at Elmgrove Broughty Ferry. It goes on to say she was a lady of eccentric habits and had few friends or visitors and very few people ever visited Elm Grove. She often left home without informing anyone and went on a trip or to London and often remained away for as long as five and six months at a time. The summary goes on to note that she seems to have only occupied two apartments in Elm Grove, the dining room and a bedroom. Many of the other apartments had not been occupied for years except for the remains of a mutton pie, a scone, a piece of brown loaf, some sugar, tea, some dates and a quantity of apples taken from the orchard, there is not food in the house. Again, you can't help but wonder why. In many ways, that summary captures about as much as we know about Jean Milne. 
You can go and look at the evidence files for yourself. They're open source and we've put a link on the Levy Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee website. Reading through the witness accounts, you get the distinct impression that no one the police talked to knew Jean Milne terribly well. She was something of a mystery. So you certainly get the impression that there's a great curiosity among the neighbours that this is this unusual woman who doesn't really necessarily fit in for the time. Historian Dr Kenneth Baxter is an archivist at the University of Dundee who studied the press coverage of the Jean Milne case in detail. He dominates the newspapers in Dundee from the day it happens. It's wall-to-wall coverage. The thing you immediately get from the newspaper coverage is this is a woman that is seen as eccentric and is leading a lifestyle that is almost seen as scandalous. I want to live my own life in my own way. It was in these terms that Miss Jean Milne, age 67, Elm Grove, West Ferry, replied to a friend who displayed anxiety at the risk she took in living alone. There was cause for the anxiety, especially as it was well known that Miss Milne was wealthy, but she smiled reassuringly and adroitly turned the conversation into other avenues. Just as an aside, if you're a detail geek, it's interesting to note this account from the Telegraph and Post, published the day after Jean Milne's body was discovered, reports her age as 67. The evidence files say she's 69. To all who would have made life brighter for her and given her the solace of human companionship, she turned a deaf ear. Her aversion to society cannot be explained. Any intrusion upon her domestic arrangements was resented. Happy in the belief that she was enjoying not only complete solitude, but privacy, she gave no thought to what those in the outside world were thinking and knew of her movements. In the circumstances of her life, it is little wonder that the searchlight of public curiosity was turned upon her every action. By her determined opposition to any change in her mode of living, she gained her heart's desire. Freedom to come and go as she liked, and with occasion to consult none but herself. But at what a price. A daring burglar effected an entrance to Elm Grove, and after making sure he would not be interrupted in his work, lay in wait for Miss Milne and struck her down from behind. Another thing they pick up on is that she's very secretive on some matters, but on other matters it says she has an openness with things that people would prefer not to hear about usually. Um, It's not explicitly clear what that is, but it does create this sort of odd impression. Margaret Sampson of Independent Means, residing at 2 Blackness Crescent, Dundee. I had known Miss Milne for many years, but we did not keep up continual acquaintanceship. For the past few years, however, the friendship was renewed. Between the latter part of the year 1911 and April of this year, she sent me a good many letters, some of which enclosed tickets for Geographical Society lectures, and these communications were always sent from the Bonington Hotel, London. In the spring of this year, I think April, my sister and I met her in Perth Road, near to Messrs J&J Grays. We were going into town, and she turned and walked with us. She told us that she had just returned from London, where she had made the acquaintance of the very nicest man she had ever met in her life, a cultured, scholarly, colleged man, neither English nor Scotch. She further said that he wanted to come to Elm Grove and pay his respects to her. She said, however, she wasn't prepared to receive his visit to Elm Grove in the meantime. We had now reached High Street, and after some further conversation, she left us to board the car for the ferry, saying she was all packed and going back to London. I remember I said to her, he must be very attractive when you cannot stay away from London from him. And she replied, oh, but he isn't in London just now. She was tremendously excited, talking and giggling shrilly about the man, so much so that people were turning round to look at her, and we were relieved when she left us, and we remarked to each other, poor thing, she is insane. Now, of course, she did get eccentrics, and eccentrics are always going to attract attention, and so Jean Milne does fit that bracket, but there is something very odd going on. I think this is one of the reasons the press love it, because there is obviously a mystery. How long is she laying dead there? Who's done it? They initially assumed the motive's robbery, but then, well, we don't think it can be robbery because there's all this money there. And then it turns out, well, she's been going down to London for months at a time. She's been on the continent. She's been seen with a man in the Highlands. The maid servant saw this young man in the house. There's people saying she's dressing 
inappropriately for a woman of her age. Even her nephew saying she's been let off the leash since her brother died. People seem to know things about her then they don't know about her. There's a newspaper report, one of the great concerns is what's going to happen to Elm Grove now. And the report says, oh, there's somebody who's a gardener looked at and could weep for the state the garden's been allowed to get into. And this comes back to this other idea that she's a woman clearly with money, but the neighbours kind of feel the house is going to rack and ruin. She's got rid of her only servant, she's got rid of her gardener, and they don't seem to be able to comprehend that. Because on once, and this, I think she had a reputation from reading the newspapers of something of a miser, certainly somebody that was thrifty, although she was making some charitable contributions. Yet, obviously, when she dies, they find out she's making these expensive trips, she's buying clothes. Again, another reason you, you get the impression the neighbours are watching her is because when they talk about her movements, they seem to all know that she goes up to town uh, on the tram and comes back with parcels, which they assume is food to sustain her. So again, this is obviously something there's a lot of curiosity. Mr Clarence Herberto Ray, mining engineer. One of the most insightful witness accounts comes from an acquaintance she met in London. I first met Miss Jean Milne of Elm Grove, Brotty Ferry near Dundee at the Bonington Hotel in January 1912. She was staying there as a guest. Um, I also was a guest there. I knew that it was a Scotch syndicate at the hotel and when I used to see this little lady flitting about, she was called by the other ladies the Canary. Packing up the fires and arranging the furniture, uh, I thought that she was a shareholder and she gave me the idea that she was interested in the hotel. I have never been outside the hotel with Miss Milne. I have seen her outside in the street, but I never spoke to her. She walked very rapidly. I remember passing her one day in the street and she did not see me at all. I don't think I've ever seen her in the street to take my hat off to her. Her vision was very bad and she used a magnifying glass when reading. Um, I remember on one occasion she told me she had had her purse snatched while in the street. Miss Mill interested me very much. She appeared to be a real good character, high-minded, innocent, and did a lot of philanthropic work. Her conversation was always of the highest possible order and perfectly clean. We all liked her and thought that she was a good little woman, well-read, high-minded, and in every respect a little lady. Um, although she had been said to be somewhat eccentric in her dress and ways, I would not call her frivolous. She did dress as a young woman, but I would not call her very eccentric. She never told me how old she was. She never told me in what way she spent her time or the source from which her income came and nothing about her life. She told me about her home in Scotland and said she had a gardener. She never communicated the fact to me that she was living alone and never suggested my calling upon her. Neither did she tell me of anyone she went in fear of. She never mentioned a nephew to me. I did not know that she had one. Our acquaintance was quite a casual one at the hotel. If this were a modern investigation, much of the legwork done by the Brawty Ferry Police in 1912 would be done sitting at a computer. Because undoubtedly one of the biggest changes in terms of science and technology since Jean Milne's case is we've gone digital, both in how we live our lives and how we investigate crimes. Professor Neve Dade, and first up, Commander Dave McLaren again. So, so for me, digital forensics is the investigative opportunities that come about through um, digital products, uh, whether that be through the, the sort of internet of things within a household, opportunities through mobile telephony, through mobile phone devices, you know, any sort of electronic device that has some sort of evidential value in terms of either its location other person's interactions with that device. There are so many opportunities that present themselves through the, you know, the, the advent of digital technology that it's a real, you know, a, a massive evidential yield for us in any big investigation. The digital footprint of an individual are really important in the investigative phase of um, the examination of a crime. And so things like people's Facebook pages, their uh, social media, whether they're on Twitter, whether they're on Instagram or whatever it is, um, tools that they might use are the subject of police investigation as well, where um, information is gleaned from those social media sources that tell us a little bit about the character of the individual. And we're back in Jean Milne's day 
what was telling us about or telling the investigators about the character of the individual was her letters, her correspondence, what people knew of her, her the associates that she met with, the clubs that she attended, the places she went. While all of that would still be, of course, used today, what's different is that back in Jean Milne's day, the the social connectivity, if you like, was done by letter writing and by postcards, um, much more, obviously, than it is done today. And what we have a replacement or our, our modern equivalent to a large extent is what we're doing on social media. So that social media footprint would be would be really important in the early stages of um, any investigation. People's whole lives are within their mobile telephone, aren't they? You know, so, so from her from her mobile telephone, had this been a modern day investigation, you know, access to her bank accounts, where had she been, when had she withdrawn money, what had she purchased, her contacts, whether that's through email, through social media, through just text messages, you know, you can tell so much about someone. Um, and generally speaking, if someone has secrets in their life, normally their mobile telephone will reveal some of those secrets whether that's activity on the internet, um, you know, through dating sites or through purchases or whatever that may be, it's a you know it's a massive opportunity for us, and, to, and it's all in the one place as well, which makes it really useful. So when you look at the case back then, um, you know, it ta- it must have taken them so long to gather a lot of that information and that evidence, and as we see with all modern day investigations. The longer they go on, the more challenging they are because people, and you can see it from the statements that some of the witnesses speak, the witnesses they speak to, they can't really pinpoint dates very accurately. And, and of course, we're able to do that much quicker these days. And it allows us to move investigations with some haste and make progress much quicker. In Jean Milne's case, we don't have that digital footprint. We don't have access to Jean Milne's Facebook or Instagram. Jean didn't tweet. So we can only interpret what we find from the evidence files and newspaper reports and try to set it in some kind of context. For Jean Milne, that means trying to understand her within the context of the Dundee of 1912. Matthew Jaron again. Dundee, interestingly, at that time had a larger population than the city does today. Uh, So I think there was 165,000 people in Dundee. Uh, Today we have just over... 150,000. But the big difference was at that time, the size of the city covered only about eight square miles, whereas today we cover about 26 square miles. So you can imagine how much more packed in uh, people were, uh, particularly obviously workers in the mills and so on were kind of squashed into you know, slum housing, tenements and so on. So I think the kind of place Dundee was really depended on who you were and your social status. I think if you were um, middle class or upper class, Dundee was actually you know a pretty good place to be. It had a lot of social amenities. It obviously, had beautiful setting, a lot of parks, you know, libraries, museums, a lot of societies and organisations, concerts. So um, you know, it was very much a, a cultural centre. But I think if you lived in, you know, if you worked in one of the mills and you lived in, you know, these terrible slum housing, you probably had a very different uh, impression. And of course, Dundee is really unique in in that such a large portion of its workforce were women. Uh, So at that time, we know that nearly a quarter of all married women in Dundee worked. And that's that's a staggering uh, percentage. I mean, the nearest equivalent was Glasgow, which had something like 5.5%, so a tiny percentage. So that, of course, then brought with it a whole load of social problems because there was very little in the way of help, childcare or any facilities like that. And so um, Dundee actually at that time had the highest proportion of infant mortality uh, in Scotland for example. Now, things were improving. Uh, There was a wonderful organisation called the Dundee Social Union, which really was trying to help some of the poorest people in the city. And they established uh, things like day nurseries, uh, restaurants for nursing mothers, and various other ways of trying to help some of these poorest people. But, you know, it was still very much a divided uh, society, I think. If you want to find out more about the Dundee of 1912, and in particular the history of both the university and the British Association for the Advancement of Science meetings, which took place in Jean Milne's Dundee, which we know she attended, then head for the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee website, where you'll find additional content. 
So how do we fit Jean Milne and what little we know of her character into that divided Dundee Matthew Jaron describes? There's some senses if you just looked at the bare fat, she would seem fairly typical. Um, a woman who's inherited money, a spinster woman who's inherited money from her brother, well, you could say that's like Mary Ann Baxter, who founded University College. The bulk of her money had come from her brother. Uh, obviously, she lived alone. You had other women who were in business. Um, for example, in the Murray Gate, you also had the husband sisters and Agnes' husband, who would go on to get the freedom of Dundee, well-known suffragette. Her sister was a suffragette as well, but not so well-known. Member of the parish council, a big figure in Dundee public life. She was, had a business in the Murray Gate. It'd be interesting to know if she, she knew Jean Milne. I've never seen anything to suggest she did or she didn't. So... That's not untypical, but this idea that she's keeping herself to herself entirely involved in the church, again, that's something that particularly a middle-class woman of the day would be expected to be involved in. But going for these holidays on her own, going to hotels in London, where, as the London press say, there's all sorts of adventurers who are going to prey on women, um, not really having any visitors, not taking pride in the appearance of her house, not taking pride in the appearance of her garden, this doesn't fit in with the norm of the day. It's, it's difficult to get an impression on, on her as a person because we're only hearing about her through the eyes and the words of other people, right? So you can't necessarily jump to any conclusion about poor old Jean Milne. Jo Millington is one of the team of forensic scientists we've asked to read through the files. She lived on her own. She's in her late 60s. Her house is described as, as as been what I would expect was relatively grand at, at the time. And yet a lot of it sounds like it's been in complete disrepair and, you know, not used. So she's probably living in a, you know, in a, in, in a, a section of the house. She's probably got a, a really nice little life going on there where she's got her own standing in the community and such like. And it looks to me as though from the description of items that are in the scene, she's out in the garden, she's picking her flowers and bits and bobs, and she comes in and potentially just disturbs an intruder. And if it's as simple as that, and it's led to this absolutely catastrophic end for her, it's just really gut-wrenching, isn't it? You know, and yet, I can't really comment on her as a person or anything like that, but it just seems that the end of all of that 69-year-old woman living in what appears to be a pretty, under a pretty independent means, and suddenly that's it. I thought she sounded like an amazing woman of her time, to be honest. She was obviously independent. She obviously didn't worry too much about what people thought of her. Uh, and you have to admire somebody like that, especially, um, you know, female. Even today, not everybody of the female gender feels that they, they can be that independent. But she clearly valued her independence. She travelled. She um, went and stayed at hotels down in London. She went and she 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 had led an interesting life and a life that she obviously wanted. To, and, and when you looked at people saying, well, I always said she shouldn't live alone and it was she obviously wanted to do that. She was obviously happy doing that. And she was obviously not going to be swayed by what other people thought of her. And I think um, that really came across when I was reading that, that those, those, those testimonies from people that knew her. So I think she sounded like an amazing character. Forensic anthropologist, Professor Lucina Hackman of the Levy Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee. And we'll be back with Lucina and the team in the next episode of Inside Forensic Science podcast when we'll be looking more closely at how Jean Milne died. A metal knob of a poker produced was found underneath some withered bay branches lying at the side of the wall beside the left side of the stair. On this knob were bloodstains and two or three fair hairs adhering to it. A metal poker, minus the head, produced, was lying on a round table to the right of the stair. On this poker were stains of blood with fair hairs adhering to it. The stone, produced, was found lying inside the door of the cloakroom. The carving fork, produced, was found on the floor near the body, the prongs being partly under the open travelling case. 
the prongs and bone handle of the fork were bloodstained. And that probably Miss Milne, on coming into the house, discovered the person in the dining room and threatened to telephone to the police when her assailant seized the carving fork, which may have been lying on the sideboard, or the drawer may have been a little open showing the weapon, and drove it repeatedly into her back, and, as she spun round, drove it into her body, as shown by the various punctures in her clothing, finishing his ghastly work by battering her head with the poker. In Inside Forensic Science, the readings were by Mark Stephen, Dan Holland, Roy Templeton, Lindsay Moyes and Charles Quinnell. The researcher was Heather Duran and the consultant Pauline Mack. The narrator was me, Penny Latin. The Inside Forensic Science podcast is an adventurous audio limited production for the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee and is funded by the Leverhulme Trust. <laughs>